Well, hello. Welcome to the show. Taking the show on the road, because I'm currently in Honolulu, Hawaii. Down here, meeting up with family. Taking a bit of a Christmas holiday in Hawaii. It is a beautiful day. Sun shiny. Waves are crashing. And you're thinking to yourself, why aren't you on the beach somewhere? Well, first off, I thought I'd take a walk to try to find some proper donuts. Because that's what you do. You, you need something to make you feel at home while you're away. Well, that didn't pan out. So I'm walking around, and I thought I'd pull over in a quiet spot, which is not easy to do. Honolulu, very touristy. A lot of cars. Not exactly a remote kind of holiday spot. You gotta get out of the city for that. But I thought I'd pull over because I can't stop thinking about Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. So I had to get my thoughts out. And this will be a spoiler version. I don't know how to talk about that movie without it being a spoiler version. So here's the thing. I'm also probably not going to speak in terms of overall like and dislike. I think once I start talking about it, when I get to the end, maybe I'll, I'll say definitively like or dislike. But right now, I'll just talk in terms of reality and how I feel this movie has summed up the Skywalker story after 40 years. How and if they've wrapped up such an enormous story and legacy and if they did that well or not. So the other thing is there's no way you're ever going to please everybody. It's just not possible now. When the movies first came out, movies were just accepted. Uh, The fans had no power to change the movie. There was no such thing as such a, a large fandom to make the directors and producers go back in the studio and make uh, new shoots and new edits. Nowadays, that's quite prevalent and obvious. Something like the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. Trailers came out. All the fans went apeshit. Look, I'm a huge Sonic Genesis, Sega Mega Drive, whatever you want to call it. It was Genesis in the States, Mega Drive in other countries. But yeah, I was a Sega fan for sure. But I didn't go nuts. Yeah, he looked a bit goofy. Well, the fans had their say. Said that Sonic looked like some goofy alien. So they went back, changed the whole thing. Re-released new trailers where Sonic looks more like Sonic. Now given that's Sonic's all CGI, so that's just cracking the whip. You know, sending all the animators back to their desks. It's different when you have to get actors in and, and work out contracts and pay disputes. But in any case, that shows the power of fans these days. And the power of fans is certainly obvious when it comes to Star Wars over the last 15 years at least. Decade for sure. Very, very opinionated. And so am I. Of course I am. So when the movies first came out, that element wasn't there. The actors, the directors, the writers, George Lucas and company did their absolute best to bring the story to life and onto the screen and did a fantastic job and we're all happy but since then there have been many attempts with the prequels and then the new movies and it is obvious that opinions can change how the studios react so in any case that's what's happened here for sure so J.J. Abrams directed The Force Awakens it was a huge uh, fanboy movie for sure it um, touched on all the right things didn't cover too much new ground but introduced new characters which you know they had to do especially since Disney's involved and there'll be huge franchise and marketing rights so they gotta kick the new characters into gear the new Star Wars universe for the young kids and when I say kids it is true it is for kids it's for families it's for adults but You have to admit, when we all saw it, you know, my generation, we were kids, uh, teenagers included. 
But, you know, your perspective changes over the years. As you're an adult, you see things differently. You see the world differently. So you see movies differently and what they mean to you and what you take from it. So in any case, to say Disney's kicking it off for the kids, there's nothing wrong with that. That's absolutely true. So The Force Awakens did that. Kicked off the new franchise, the new Disney empire. And it was fine. Most people were like, yeah, yeah, it's all right. But they didn't go apeshit and they weren't divided over it. Then obviously, with The Last Jedi, Ryan Johnson came along and he went rogue and he just went way off the farm uh, and took the story into a direction that some people didn't think was something that was honoring the original trilogy and certainly wasn't canon, which means it didn't really follow any of the, you know, the rules of the world or the story that was, that was painted before it, that was created. Which again, you could say, hey, he was being artistic and trying his own thing. Well, look, in my opinion, that didn't work. But in others, it did, because The Last Jedi was hugely divided. The fans split right down the middle. Uh, and yeah, The Last Jedi certainly went rogue and tried to come up with new storylines that didn't really fly and didn't quite fit uh, with Rey and Kylo. And certainly underutilized Mark Hamill as Luke. I mean, come on. It is the Skywalker story. So I do think it was a little bit unfair not to include him in a more pivotal ro role. But anyway, that's already happened. The Last Jedi is over. It went in an opposite direction. Well, I'll say this. If you liked The Last Jedi, I do not think you'll like The Rise of Skywalker. Again, I will be talking spoilers pretty soon. So, red alert, spoilers, if you're listening. If you... Uh, hated The Last Jedi or didn't like it in any way, I do think that you'll like The Rise of Skywalker much better. I'm not saying you'll like it overall, but you'll definitely put it above The Last Jedi. Now, in saying that the story is quite different, yes, it is. Um, so, J.J. Abrams is back on board. So, essentially, and I'm not trying to make excuses, but again, the actors, don't ever blame the actors or, or even the director um, for a, a smaller point, but you know, they're all getting paid to do a job and I think they're doing the best they can. No one's deliberately trying to ruin something. I don't think anyone's deliberately trying to run it into the ground. Um, everyone's after Kathleen Kennedy. Yeah, maybe she is, but that's from a producer point of view, someone who's sitting outside of it, thinking of the bigger picture and all the money and all the franchising and merchandise. So she's not looking at it from, from the inside, from the artistic perspective. So yeah, don't get mad at the actors. They, they were fine. Actually, they were great. They did their best. Tried to bring a bit of camaraderie back and humor to the gang. And that was fine. But in any case, J.J. Abrams, what he had to work with was trying to fix, trying to undo or put back together what Ryan Johnson had undone. So he had all these pieces laid out before him and had to, to fix it somehow in this final chapter. So someone's taken a well-crafted book and smashed it to pieces and he has to put it back together. So that's the other thing that's, that's happening here. And on top of that, all the fans going apeshit after The Last Jedi and even after Solo saying, we're not on board with any of this, all these backstories. We're against Ryan Johnson. We're against Disney and Kathleen Kennedy and where they're taking this franchise. We're up in arms. We're not going to go see it. That's it. We're into the streets with pitchforks and flames. That's it. We're going to light fire to Lucasfilm. Oh, yeah. The, they go after George, too. Poor guy. You know? He can't even, can't even sit down at peace at Skywalker Ranch and just sit in his rocking chair drinking some lemonade. Yeah, they're after him, too. So this is all happening while this movie's being made. So it's a tough gig. Um, and the other thing is, is I think there were at least three versions from what I've been told. Um, you know, they have been having test audiences in movies since the golden age of film, and that's quite normal. And in this one, of course, they're gonna do a test audience. So there was a J.J. Abrams cut. Didn't go quite well, apparently. Um, then there's, I think, a Kathleen Kennedy cut. There are all these different versions trying to appeal to the audience. 
In any case, I don't know which one got released because the ending was still not exactly to my taste. But in any case, all that's brewing in the background and happening. And the final release, literally the final cut sent out to the theater was only done, honestly, a little over a week before or, or closer. So it's cutting it quite close, which means, you know, there's a lot of changes made. So in any case, to the movie, The Rise of Skywalker. Uh, I don't know where to begin. Again, this is just comments, not an overall like or dislike. Um, essentially, here's the good things. Uh, Abrams was smart, and he put the gang back together. So in The Last Jedi, you know, everyone gets split up, which is why would you do that? That's not what Star Wars is about. It's about coming together. Um, even if you have, uh, you know, a couple groups, but you can't just split everyone off and send them, send them away. So at least uh, there are a lot of scenes where everyone's together, which is what you want to see. Which is the opportunity they missed with Han, Leia, and Luke. And, you know, they missed that opportunity. It's quite sad. There should have been a scene with all of them in it, you know. But again, that's the past. You can't change that. So, yeah, they get the gang back together. They're finally out there on their adventures together. Um, right. So it looks like Poe, he's got a bit of a past. They just sort of threw that in there. Um, all right, that's all right. So he's, he's a spice runner, which in the Star Wars universe is like a drug runner. So that's cool. So he's got this bad boy past or whatever. And that's shown by um, a few tricks he knows. Hey, Han Solo is a smuggler, right? Han Solo is the most popular character. So he's using his uh, smuggling skills at the start of the movie to, this, to do um, light speed jumping. Now I'm gonna, not going to get technical because it'll probably annoy me. But, you know, sometimes movies set these rules in the universe. And I think you should just kind of stick by them because it throws people off. You know, I thought light speed traveling through hyperspace is a complex thing where the computer has to be involved and proper coordinates so you don't, you know, light speed jump into the middle of a planet or something or next to a comet or, you know, a black hole. These are important things. Traveling in space is complicated. You know, Han Solo even said that to Luke. You know, traveling through hyperspace ain't like dust and crops, boy. Come on. That's a famous line, but he's right. He says it in the Han Solo cowboy way, but he's right. Traveling through space is a complicated thing. Anyway, they're all in the Millennium Falcon, and Poe is trying to escape uh, the TIE fighters that are after him by doing this light speed skipping, which is quickly jumping to an, a new part in space, to a new location, a new destination quickly, and then quickly jumping to another destination. Um, in a row, in a row, three, four times in a row. And they're all freaking out, because like, what the hell are you doing? And then they're like, how do you know how to do this? And that comes up a couple times. He does a few things that are a bit, uh, uh, something that a, a crook would do. And uh, they're wondering, how do you know how to do all these things that are a bit insidious? And then he tells them he used to be a spice runner. So that's fine. So they're adding new layers to these characters. I don't mind that. But there's a lot of story to take in in this movie. Um, it's action-packed, yes. I think sometimes J.J. Abrams forgets Star Wars is not necessarily an action movie. I mean, there are plenty of parts in the original Star Wars where they're just sitting and talking and, and dialogue and absorbing the moment and the background. And, and then something happens. It doesn't always have to be nonstop. But it's a different audience these days, right, I suppose? Maybe they think they're targeting an audience that's expecting uh, Mission Impossible or Fast and Furious. They're expecting that. He did that to Star Trek, again. I won't go into that now, but Star Trek is, again, a whole different thing. It's very cerebral. It's very um, uh, meeting new species and creating new bonds and going beyond. It's not always necessarily about full-on action. But anyway, he turns Star Trek into action movies, too. So there's a lot of action. You have to be ready for that. The first 20 minutes, at least. I'm not knocking that, by the way. I'm just saying how it's different from other Star Wars movies. So we get into Rey. Everyone's obviously, Rey's a hot topic. 
She's a bit of a Mary Sue. She has all these skills, but she wasn't really taught. That annoys some people. Like I was saying, Luke was only taught by Yoda for about, you know, a couple days, uh, you know, with Yoda. And uh, his skills were mediocre at best. Most of his skills were just um, denying using the skills. Most of his skills were laying down his lightsaber and, and just being calm. You know, he learned how to make a few boxes float here and there. But let's be honest, Luke, until maybe The Last Jedi, was not exactly a Jedi Master. But Rey is. She's just amazing. There's a scene where she's just floating there with a, a bunch of boulders around her and rocks, and she's just meditating uh, with her knees folded. So she's got all kinds of, of tricks up her sleeve, and everyone's annoyed that they don't know where they came from. Well, that does sort of get explained at the end as to why the force is so powerful in her and again this is a spoiler i have to say this because i don't know else how to talk about it otherwise so the family lineage that everyone wants to know about that everyone wanted to know about in the last jedi finally gets revealed here in that she's actually a palpatine she is the granddaughter of emperor palpatine who yes is in the movie and apparently has been pulling the strings all along now if you believe that that was a story arc they had in mind from the beginning um, you're crazy. There's no way. There's no way they had that in mind when they were just jumping around with The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. There's no way they sat down in a room like the Marvel movies did and plotted out the next 10 years. No way. That was something that was a last minute fix, I believe, to try to bring back the original fans and the audience. So they threw an Emperor Palpatine, and apparently he's been in control of all of this, uh, including Soak, which was ridiculous because he was killed in the last jedi by kylo um quite easily mind you and apparently the emperor created him too so yes so ray is a palpatine and that i suppose would explain why she's so strong with the force and has all these skills without necessarily being taught by a jedi master uh, we also learn, and we only learn this from one quick scene, which is kind of sad. Um, since Luke used himself to project himself across the universe in The Last Jedi, and that obviously drained him and killed him, um, he's gone, so she's got no uh, master to teach her. Well, turns out, Leia was her teacher. And we only see that in one scene, actually, uh, where it's actually Luke training Leia. And from there, we assume that Leia's been taught, and then we see that um, Leia is speaking to Rey about how to use the Force and, and stay calm and center herself. So she's taken over as her, her teacher, as her Jedi Master. That's fine. I'm not going to argue with that. That's kind of touching. Um, so, so Palpatine's in control. And I'm sure in the trailer you saw all the Star Destroyers, like thousands of them. That's a lot of manpower. A lot of construction and contract deals. But anyway, that's not my problem. That's someone else's. That's a logistics guy, you know, somewhere working for Palpatine. Like, I, I, I don't have all the paperwork. I got get all these signed. That's not my problem. So yeah, there's thousands of Star Destroyers somehow that have been stored here on the planet he's on. By the way, it's a secret Sith planet, which is hilarious. The planet he's hiding on is not on any of the the star charts. More importantly, it's forbidden. It is forbidden to have these. It is even forbidden to speak the language of Sith um, or to even interpret it, which is, again, I'm jumping around. There's a apparently this homing beacon, and there's several of them, these little little boxes, like the little boxes from Hellraiser, but but not a cube. <laughs> some little secret glowing pyramid looking symbol um, is what they have to use which is a map to find the emperor on his secret hidden planet so the gang has to jump around to all these different worlds to try and locate the different pieces and put together the puzzle and the map and and all of this written in sith so the language of the sith is forbidden um, there's a part where C-3PO explains this, that, um, again, spoiler, they're on a planet and they find this dagger. It's a Sith dagger. 
a real dagger, not a lightsaber dagger, which is weird. And it's got the Sith language written on it. And again, a piece of the puzzle to give the directions of this secret planet where Palpatine is. And C-3PO says, I'm forbidden to translate this in my programming, in the core programming. I'm unable to translate this. The only way that it would work is to have a memory wipe and to reset my programming and then I'd be able to read it. I suppose it would be resetting him to a bad droid because obviously there's the Empire droids and there's the Rebel droids. Isn't that hilarious? Didn't really like that. That's just ridiculous. That seems like lazy writing. But in any case, they do have to do that. I'll leave that with you. I won't spoil the rest, but I'll just say they end up having to reset 3PO's system, his CPU, and it includes his memory, so he'll end up losing all his memories. That's why he says in the trailer, I'm taking one last look at my friends. So, anyway. So he's got to translate this to give them coordinates to find the homing beacon thing to then find the planet. So again, that's kind of the main plot of the whole movie. They have to find little Sith homing beacon to find Palpatine and destroy him. And and while the rebels are getting ready to fight the good fight and to go fight the thousands of Star Destroyers, and the Star Destroyers all have what on them? A big old gun. Well, of course, Star Wars loves big old guns. This time, instead of one big gun, on a Death Star or inside a planet, it's lots of guns. Thousands of guns make up one big gun. And their aim is to, again, take over all the planets and rule the Empire by fear and death. So that's fine. That fits with the whole Empire. Um, And instead of the First Order, it's the Final Order. Again, I feel like that's lazy writing. Emperor Palpatine keeps saying, Give the final order. The final order. Not the first. The final order. So it's the final order. I get it. It all ties in. Sure. I believe you. Whatever you say, JJ. Poor JJ. He's got to put all this stuff together. So there's a lot of story going on. Um, So Leia's down on the planet with the rebels, getting this ready. Now, so I have to talk about Leia. So obviously, Carrie Fisher... The amazing and beautiful Carrie Fisher passed away. They did shoot some scenes, so I'm sure they had some left over. I feel like some of it was CGI. I won't knock it because it looked pretty good. But again, huge spoiler. Uh, Halfway through, um, she dies. She fades away in much like the Jedi Yoda style. Fades away into the blanket to become a Jedi ghost. Now here's the part that I don't like, how she died. You know, everyone should go out with a bang, especially huge characters, not not with a whimper. Something more poignant. Well, she goes out by simply whispering Ben. Ben uh, Kylo Ren, her son. She says, Ben. And all that effort to reach out, and instead of using a force FaceTime, which Kylo and Rey use. Oh, they use that a lot in this. It's nothing but Force FaceTime. You know? Hello? Where are you? I can't tell you, but I think I know where you are. Tell me where you are. So, yeah. They do their little video chats. Definitely. You know, Force FaceTime or Star Wars Skype. Whatever you want to call it. But Leia just does it once. And uh, Ben does hear it, which is nice. Uh, While he's Kylo and fighting Rey, as they do a lot in this movie too. But after that, it's so much effort for her, she died. I'm like, oh my god, that's it? You had her floating in space in Jedi, sorta, sorta float flying. Uh, And then in this one, she just says, bad, and she's gone. So anyway, that's Leia gone. So the lightsaber scenes are pretty cool. Um, I'm going to go back to the prequel. I'm going to go back to episode one, just um, with Obi-Wan. And uh, look, the lightsaber uh, scenes in that one were, were awesome. Because um, essentially the, the guy who played Darth Maul, he was the stunt coordinator for that. And he was, he was like, uh, you know, some samurai sword master guy. And with the, with the stick um, and the staff... So he taught, he taught all that, and then 
and then he actually played Darth Maul in the scenes. So look, if you're comparing lightsaber scenes, uh, the ones in in episode one are actually some of the best. Uh, and the older movies, you know, they're still using rotoscoping and, and physical special effects and animation, overlaying negatives and actually animating. It's a whole different process. It's not as easy. Now, someone just, you know, goes on the computer and CGI's it. But these ones, compared to episode one, they were awesome in that they were, look, they were emotional and meaningful, and the backgrounds were amazing. There were, you know, there were slow-mo parts. There were some parts where they would pause because it seems like they were evenly matched, Kylo and Rey. But in any case, they were, they were really visually stunning, but not necessarily the best from a, from a stunt choreographer point of view. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Leia reaches out to Ben, and then she's gone. <clears throat> so Kylo, he is quite torn in this movie. Which, again, you probably saw that coming. He was going to be torn, much like uh, Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader was. And he's going to be torn between the dark side and the light side. Um, Eventually, he does come over to the light side. And he does this in another scene, which is a bit of a controversy. So, Kylo and Rey have a fight. Um, (laughs) Kylo actually sort of kicks his ass, sort of. Only because I think, you know, uh, Ray kicks Kylo's ass because Kylo's a bit conflicted. So, Ray kicks his butt and he's sitting there. Uh, she's run him through with the lightsaber. Now, she uses a new power in the Force, which I didn't even know existed. And again, this is where they don't quite follow Star Wars canon. Um... This is sort of a spoiler also if you've been watching The Mandalorian, sorry. But uh, Baby Yoda, I call him Baby Yoda, he's not Yoda, but he's the same creature that Yoda is. But anyway, everyone's calling him Baby Yoda, you know who I mean. He's adorable, he's completely stolen the show from The Mandalorian. But Baby Yoda uses a little trick where he heals um, some beast that The Mandalorian is fighting, uh, puts his hand up. And he's able to to heal him um, from the inside. So you could have a huge blast wound or cut or lightsaber wound. And, you know, it goes and gets filled up and all fixed. And you're all healed. Wipes the slate clean. So it looks like the Force has physical healing powers. And not just a small cut. You could be, you know, cut through and you could still get healed. So Rey uses this, apparently again. Nobody taught her. She just... She's just good at it. She just has it. It's just natural. Um, she puts her hand down, and she heals his lightsaber wound. Uh, and then she takes off, which is kind of cruel. <laughs> I thought she just splits in his ship, mind you, <laughs> if I recall. I thought that was funny. She, she stabbed him, healed him, said, sorry, mate, and then took his ride. That was tough. Left him on, in the middle of the, the ocean. On, um, uh, they were fighting on broken parts of the Death Star. Uh, I won't get into that too much. That's that's where one of the pieces of the des- the um, the secret Palpatine planet homing beacon was. Uh, they were on the Death Star, the big Death Star from Return of the Jedi, the one that the um, Ewoks are happy and dancing when it was blown up. Now I thought that was blown to bits, as in two bits, atomized. But no, apparently there's huge chunks of it that fell to the planet below. Um, I don't know if it was Endor. I think it was another planet. Maybe it was Endor. Fell to the planet below into the raging sea. And like, I mean raging sea. So anyway, if you believe that happened, there you go. Um, So they're fighting on that. She heals him, takes off in his ship. So he's there thinking, what the hell? Well, he sees... Who does he see? He sees Grumbly, his Grumbly old dad, Harrison Ford, Han Solo. He sees the ghosts of Han, the ghosts of Solo dad. What are you doing, kid? Now, here's the thing. He wasn't a Force ghost, which is kind of not fair. I suppose it's only fair because only Jedis get to be Jedi Force ghosts. So let's say it was really a memory. It was just his thoughts, okay? Before everyone panics and gets in an uproar, oh, wait, how is it he sees Han, but Han's not a Jedi? 
look, it's a memory like you would have of anyone who has passed away. So he's there talking to dad, and dad's saying, well, you did it, kid. What are you going to do now? You going to do the right thing or what? You going to do what I did? Gives him a bit of a pep talk. Gives him a Harrison Ford grouchy pep talk and then fades away. And that's the last we see of him there. <clears throat> now, going back to the Death Star, still giant chunks of it left over from Return of the Jedi. So Palpatine is still alive, but he's been kept alive for a freaking hundred years by way of using, I suppose, uh, the dark methods of science from the dark side. And that sort of makes sense and ties into Vader himself. Vader was fucked up bad by Obi-Wan, left there in the lava and the flames, which is also very awkward if you think back to that moment. I can't save you. I'm just over here. You're going to have to melt and die. I, I, I hate you. I'm, I'm not even going to call for help. But you just lay there and die. You've done the wrong thing and you know it. You're going to die in the lava. Even though I could call for help or throw out a rope, I have the high ground. And you'll have to die. Anyway, that was a bit rough. I can understand Anakin's anger at that. <laughs> so yeah, Anakin's messed up bad missing all his limbs, most of his limbs. So Palpatine put him back together in what you see as his Darth Vader suit, the iconic mask and inside and the respirator and the breathing. Now, I suppose in our world, that would just be using science, medical science. But in that world, it's using like dark science, Sith science. Rather than leaving someone to die naturally, you've created him into a zombie person, into a Vader. Well, that's what Palpatine is, but he doesn't have a mask on. He's just hooked up to a giant Sith respirator, a giant evil respirator with tubes and things coming out of him. And he's got zombie eyes and zombie hands. He essentially looks like a zombie, which is what he is. So he's been kept alive all these years. I suppose that's why they had to explain the giant chunks of the Death Star, because it was atomized. He wouldn't even have a body. He wouldn't even have a zombie body. But apparently chunks of it fell and someone came back and and I I put it to you like this. He probably had an emperor panic chamber. Of course he would. With all the money they forked out for the Death Star, I'm sure the contractor said, look, we're spending a lot here. We're gonna throw in a few things. We're gonna throw in the gold bathroom and and you know, some of the amenities and perks. We're gonna do the tiles you wanted. Um, but we're gonna throw in a panic room. What do you think of that? Yes, a panic room. I'll use it wisely. Yes, so. Look, Palpatine must have gone into his Emperor panic room or something after Vader threw him down the hole, the mine shaft or whatever in the Death Star. Maybe he landed and with his last breath, he just pulled pulled himself to his panic room nearby and shut the door. In any case, someone found his body and hooked him up. So he's still alive, hooked up to the Sith respirator. So lo and behold, they finally find all the beacons Um, They figure out where he is. Um, Ray finally catches up with Luke. Sorry, yes, spoiler. Luke's in it, only as a force ghost. Uh, She's there with with Kylo's ship that she stole. But essentially, she went back to to the planet that Luke was on originally, where she was training in The Last Jedi. Her plan was to do what Luke did. Um because she knows what she is. She knows she's a Palpatine. She's been told this at this point. And she's like, I'm gonna sacrifice myself. I'm too evil, I'm gonna shut myself away from the world. Like Luke shut himself away from the world. So she's gone back to the island to be a hermit, like Luke. And just as she's throwing her lightsaber, now she's throwing her lightsaber away. Now, who did this in The Last Jedi? If you recall, Ray humbly, humbly is there to be taught by the great Luke Skywalker and hands him his lightsaber in such an, an honoring way. And what does Luke do? He chucks it over his shoulder because he doesn't give a shit. Now, yeah, now fans didn't like that. I didn't like that either. So in one of the fix it moments, JJ Abrams fixing it, Ray throws the lightsaber and Luke catches it and steps out of the fire. Uh, She was burning the ship. She was burning Kylo's ship. 
so that she couldn't use it to leave, so that she could abandon herself there. So he emerges from the flames, holding the lightsaber, and basically says to her, a Jedi's weapon shouldn't be treated like this. Are you kidding me? From the same man who chucked it not that long ago and said it doesn't mean shit and all the Jedi should disappear? Yeah, well, guess what? He says, I was wrong. Oh, shit. Thanks for that. What a great story. It's all been leading up to this, really. You tell me you guys wrote in Palpatine and you wrote that Luke was just going to say, nah, forget it, I give up, and just throw the lightsaber, nonchalantly say, fuck the Jedi. And now he's come back full circle saying, I was wrong. You should fight. Up in arms. Uh, all, together, all, all together has won. One for all and all for one. Here's your lightsaber. Whatever. Anyway. So they've written that, tried to fix it. Luke's trying to, to convince her that the Jedi path is the right way. Uh, and this is important, that the lightsaber is an important part of that. Symbolizes that. Whatever. Anyway. Uh, so... He convinces her to join the fight that all the Jedi are in you. In you. you heard that in the trailer. All the Jedi live in you now. Because that'll become a key point later. All the Jedi live in you. A thousand generations live inside you. So she's stuck on the planet. Now, she's not going to do the Force Project because that's been done and that'd be lame. So she's got to get off the planet. So what does she use? Well, holy shit. Luke's X-Wing is still there. There you go. Red 5 standing by. Yep, there it is. So Luke Skywalker, um, his X-Wing, is sitting in the bottom of the little inlet there in the ocean near the island that he's on. And it's been sitting there since, since he marooned himself there. So he raises up his own ship for her to use. Yes, it was a lovely fanboy moment, 100%. That's all it was. Raises his original X-Wing, much like Yoda did from Dagobah in the swamps, when Luke went, I can't, it's too heavy. It's too hard. It's too heavy, Yoda. I can't do it. And he went and pouted, and Yoda used the force. Well, this time, Luke redeemed himself. I can do it. I can lift X-Wings now. What do you think of that? So he lifts the ship out of the water so that Rey can head to the secret Sith planet and destroy the Emperor. So she does that. She's on her way. Lo and behold, we almost forgot about the the rest of the cast. So they're all getting ready for the big fight. But how do they do this? Because there is no official uh, rebel army anymore. There's no official fleet. Well, they gotta send for help. So they do that. Go find help. So they send Lando. Yes, Lando Carisian's back. And that was, that was awesome. That was good to see him, although short-lived. Um, yeah, Billy Dee Williams is back as Lando. So he uses the Millennium Falcon to apparently scour the universe in, I don't know, in a matter of hours to find help, to find backup support, uh, ships, weapons, people. <clears throat> so they're off doing that. Um, I will say there is one scene. <laughs> they're escaping from one of the planets where they're searching for the homing beacon thing. And uh, Chewbacca gets taken prisoner. And then you see the ship that he was um, taken aboard, and the ship's taking off, but Ray tries to use the force to pull it back. Well, Kylo shows up, because he did a face, um, a force FaceTime with her. He shows up on the planet and fights her. Uh, and essentially, they use the ship as an arm wrestling match. She's trying to pull it down, and he's trying to push it away. Well, the ship explodes because they're both using the force on it and it explodes. And it's mostly Rey that does that. She unleashes uh, lightning, the dark side lightning, like the Emperor has, like only the Sith have. And then that's when she sort of freaks out too. She shits herself that she could do that. So she blew up the ship, and as far as she knows, she killed Chewbacca, as did the rest of the audience. Sorry, spoiler. So Chewbacca's dead. Uh, But he's not dead. He's actually was taken in a different transport. Oh boy, bait and switch. Ha <laughs> ha, so clever. Yeah, the audience is like, ah, happy but sad that it was a bit cheesy, the little bait and switch thing. Um, oh, talking about Chewie. Look, Chewie always brings it, damn it. We love Chewbacca. He can do no wrong. <laughs> but I thought it was interesting in this one. When Leia dies, Chewie goes absolutely apeshit. 
Now, his best friend in life, a man who saved his life, and Wookiees are notoriously, uh, when they connect with someone, when you save their, save their life, it's like a bond for life. That's the Wookiee thing. I know that's a bit of nerdism, but that's apparently the Wookiee way. Um, Han saved his life. Uh, that was known long before the prequel and all that bullshit. That was the story. Um, and that's why he's not only his friend, he's really, he's like connected to him forever. Um, when Han died, he just kind of went, he's sad. In this one, he breaks down in a lumping heap of brown fur when Leia dies. He's just going nuts. His arms are raising and he's on the ground and people's trying to help him up. He's like, he goes nuts. I get it. She's his family too. They're part of the family. They've been together, had a lot of adventures and sad moments together. But I do, I do think that should have been saved for Han. You know, that sort of breakdown. But yeah, he goes apeshit when Leia dies. <laughs> so yeah, so Lando's out looking for looking for help. Uh, Ray takes Luke's X-wing to the secret Sith planet, and there's the Emperor hooked up to his his Sith respirator, and he's surrounded by uh, looks like a bunch of druids, <laughs> just you know, in hoods. But obviously they're all Sith followers. But there's like thousands of them. I don't know if they've all been living down there in caves in this planet because it's underground uh, in this cave I don't know if there's just one toilet between all of them I don't know even if they go to the toilet I don't know what they eat uh, I don't know but somehow they're living down there in this cave and uh, Ray starts to fight him I won't get specific you can imagine how the dialogue goes I'm here to kill you uh, but you're my granddaughter and the, the and I will live in you yeah so that's the only other plot kicker he wants Ray to kill him because essentially he wants his spirit to go into into Ray. So what? 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 So that's why Ray's been kept around as well, apparently, as a vessel for him, a young new granddaughter vessel. That's just creepy and weird. So yeah, he is trying to um, entice her, as he did with Luke, to turn to the dark side. But in this case. Uh, with Luke, it was to join him by his side. He wanted him to kill Vader so he could be the new Vader sidekick. Well, he doesn't want a sidekick anymore. He wants to get into her. He wants to get inside. Not in a gross way, but he wants to take over a body uh, and get out of his zombie body and, and continue to use her and reign as empress over the universe. So that's that thing, too. He's trying to get her to get mad, but there's a catch. Um... That's kind of stupid, actually. Why would you tell someone that? You should just get them mad and then take over their body. But, you know, classic evil villain, he takes the time to tell his whole plot. So this is what I'm going to do. Here we go. Step one, you kill me. Step two, I take over your body with my spirit. Step three, I rule the universe. Let's go. That's ridiculous. Anyway, they're fighting. Guess who shows up to help? Yes, Ben. We'll call him Ben now because he's no longer Kylo because he also chucked his lightsaber. So he's on the, on the planet still, in the middle of the ocean. Uh, he just had his vision of, of dad, of Han, and he takes his, his stupid medieval lightsaber <laughs> with the two guards on the end, which was just poorly constructed, if you ask me, because on the close-up, you can see there's wires and stuff sticking out. I feel like he failed lightsaber class badly. Like, you know, the teachers are walking around, Luke's going, that's really interesting what you're doing with his lightsaber. You could put the wires on the inside, you know. I like them on the outside. Don't argue with me. All right. So he throws away his shitty lightsaber. And he goes to join... Um, Ray On the secret Sith planet to kill the Emperor. So he shows up. They start fighting together. Okay. New twist. Here's the twist. He sees that they sort of join forces. And he's intrigued by this. And he sees how powerful they are together. That together, their bond is even more immense than, than just uh, individually. So, I shit you not, he starts sucking out their life force. Oh, wait a minute, you couldn't do this the first time? Anyway, he literally starts, instead of pushing energy, like he normally does, he switches the vacuum, puts it on reverse, he starts sucking the energy out of them. <laughs> sucking their energy out. 
and lo and behold he goes i i can't believe it look at my hand so his zombie hand starts turning into a nice fresh hand so obviously he's got a new plan he's like screw it i don't want to be a 20 year old something girl i just want to be myself but the young version of palpatine out on the town so i guess he's gonna fix himself instead so he sucks the life out of them they're gone both of them gone meantime oh, i'll just say this so that you know it uh the rebel forces show up to fight all the star destroyers uh their plan is to knock out um this radio tower that apparently controls all the star destroyers i love how they they use the they use their technology in the worst ways uh, instead of having multiple servers, they've got one. You know what I mean? Instead of having multiple towers, they've got one. Uh, they don't really believe in the, the Amazon way, you know, spreading it around, having your, your server hubs around the world. But anyway, they've got one radio transmission tower that apparently all the star destroyers will go into tur turmoil and not know how to get off the planet because they've got to get out into space because they're, they're dry docked on the planet. Anyway, that's ridiculous. So they're fighting that. Oh, God. Everyone's getting together. I'm just going to say this part in a blur, because that's what it was to me. Um, strange space horses riding on the deck of a Star Destroyer. BB-8 leading the way. Lando shows up with help. Thousands of ships. They all freak out. The radio tower gets blown up, but then they have a backup. Um, it's just silly. It's all silliness, that part. It's just silliness. It's trying to be Return of the Jedi, but poorly. And sort of taking away a bit from Jedi disrespectfully if you ask me um same sort of plot you know go get help help arrives anyway so at this point ray starts to hear she's dead or dying she's laying there she starts to hear the voices of all the jedi past yoda and luke and everyone everyone's speaking to her from beyond and they all tell her that all the power, all their power is inside her. That all the generations of all the Jedi are inside her and all their power. Okay, that's, that's a lovely sentiment. Trying to suppose to tell her that it's not all just the evil in you, it's all of the good side of the Jedi is in you. And to use that. So, uh, she gets up. She's fine now, I guess, just with the pep talk. The Jedi ghost pep talk. And... The Emperor is pissed off. He's gone back to plan, plan A, plan B, or 1B, or 2B. I don't know which plan it is. He goes back to the original plan to kill her. So he starts killing her. The electricity is coming out of his fingers. She's blocking it with one lightsaber. Uh, and then she picks up Kylo's lightsaber. Oh, sorry. Kylo threw his lightsaber away. So... <laughs> Here's the other twist I forgot to say. Um, she's got Luke's lightsaber. And now she has the other lightsaber. So she's using two lightsabers to block the Emperor's powers. And reflect it back on him. And, I don't know, she uses some other force power in her. She's just staring at him. It's a staring contest. He's shooting electricity. She's blocking it with lightsabers. And he blasts, she blasts it towards him, and she obliterates him and all the other druids, Sith <laughs> followers in the cave. They're all blown up. And you're like, oh, I knew it'd come to that. I knew it'd come down to just her and all her amazing powers, all her amazing Mary Sue powers, destroying the Emperor with no one else's help. That's fine. So she does that, he's dead. Well, shit. Um, she falls to the ground. Meanwhile, the rebels, they're doing their thing, and then help arrives. So, thousands, hundreds of thousands of ships all come out of light speed onto the planet, and they're amazed because they can't believe that they found that much help. And one of the Star Destroyers, Star Destroyers, Star Destroyers, someone remarks... Um, who, who, is, who is this army? I didn't know they had an army. How did they find... It's not an army, it's just people. Uh, it's just people. It's just people. It's people helping people. Just people. All right, lovely sentiment. It's just people. But people with guns. 
people with blasters, people with ships, people with blasters. Okay, so they show up and they fight the good fight and win. Yay. It's like Return of the Jedi again. Yay. So, Ray's gone, yeah? Well, shit. In classic Romeo and Juliet style, for real, Ray's gone. But guess who wakes up? Boom! Ben wakes up. I'm okay now. I don't know why. It was just a flesh wound. And he missed the party too, by the way, which is annoying. You know? He could have helped a little more. I thought that would have been better. But anyway, he goes over to her. Holds her up. And guess what he does? Well, you know about that new power they've got. The force healing power. Yeah, well... Ray had used that earlier in the movie, like Yoda did, like I was talking about from Mandalorian. So Ray used that to heal the power of some snake creature they found on the planet, burrowing below. Thought it was going to kill him, but apparently it was just wounded, like, you know, a lion with a thorn in his paw. She pulled out the thorn. Well, she healed the snake, and he slithered away. And they're all freaked out as to how she could do that. Well, now that's been introduced to us as a thing. It's a force healing thing. So Ben uses that on Ray, puts his hand on her. Um, it's no visible wound; she's just dead. So that's the thing. He's going to step beyond, which, which is interesting. Not only can he heal, looks like he's got the power to bring him back, bring him back from the dead. That's the biggest healing power of all, and that's exactly what he does. She goes, <gasps> she gasps, and she's alive. So he used the force in him, the power in him, to bring her back from the dead. They look at each other awkwardly. We're not sure what they're gonna do. It's it's the fight or fuck moment. They're not brother and sister anymore, so it's still pretty awkward. What do they do? They kiss. They kiss. And again, thank God that she's a Palpatine and he's a Skywalker, because if they were both Skywalkers, yawa, no, bad, very bad. So they kiss. And they were like, oh, Okay, this could be a thing. Maybe they'll rule together. Oh, shit, he's dead. Yeah. So, Kylo, obviously, used all that he had to bring her back. Well, isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? I mean, really. So, yeah. So, he used his power, drained himself. She's alive. So, look, I'm going to skip to the end again. Spoiler. So, at the end... Uh... Ray flies back to Tatooine, to Luke's old house, um, out in the desert, and uh, she buries uh, the two lightsabers, so Leia had a lightsaber, obviously she was in training with Luke to become a Jedi, so she had her own lightsaber. Again, not to geek out, but each Jedi actually has to create their own lightsaber. They gotta go find the kyber crystals and they create their own. That's part of the training and how you complete your Jedi training, to create your own unique lightsaber. They all do it. So obviously Leia did it, so she had her own. It had like sparkly diamonds on it or something, because it was a girl one. I'm not, I'm, I'm just being honest, I'm telling you. I'm not trying to be chauvinistic. It had like diamond things on it, so it was, it was a pretty lightsaber. It was Leia's, it should be. So she went there and she had Leia's lightsaber that was passed on to her and Luke's lightsaber. And she buries them in the sand using the force again because she can't dig a hole. She can't be bothered. She just moves her hand and a hole forms and they, they're wrapped up in a rag. So she's down there to bury them for maybe another generation one day to pass it on to them. So that's, that's lovely. And she turns around and some old old lady, old whatever, old lady creatures come by. Oh, hasn't been anyone around these parts for a long time. For many years. What are you doing here? So, I mean, look, that was a bit funny. She goes, hey, hey, well, what's your name? And everyone's like, oh, shit. Here it is. Oh, God, we've already, we already know. We don't even need to be told we know. Hey, what, what's your name? Ray. Ray, just Ray? Ray what? Gotta have a last name. Can't just be Ray. Can't have a first name. I've got two names. What's your last name? Is it Ray? Ray what? What's your last name? <sighs> so she turns off in the distance. She looks at the iconic two sons from Tatooine. And lo and behold, there's 
Luke, Force Ghost, and Leia, Force Ghost together. Like proud parents, but not really because they're brother and sister, but whatever. So they're together looking at her, and she smiles a bit. And yes, she says it. I'm Ray, Ray Skywalker. Oh, that's your name. You're a Skywalker. Well, come on down for lunch. So that's it. So she's taken the name, but she's not really a Skywalker. I don't know how you feel about that, but I feel weird. I guess it was part of Luke's speech to her in the movie saying that it's more, it's more about the connection between friends. It's not always about blood, which is a nice sentiment. I get that. Because Star Wars is also about that. It's about the connections made from all these random people from random places that wouldn't normally fit together, but they band together for a cause and they become lifelong companions, friends with a connection that can be just as strong as a bloodline, as a brother or sister, or mother or father. That's lovely. I get that. But a lot of fans will obviously go shit over that. That it wasn't a real Luke Skywalker lineage passed on or necessarily earned in any way. But it was just that she wanted to identify with that side of the Force, the good side, and all the good in her, and the friends she's made, and the connections. So she's chosen, which maybe is even more powerful than that being bestowed on you from a bloodline. She chose to be a Skywalker. So I suppose that's nice. So in any case, you could say the rise of Skywalker was her. You could say the rise of Skywalker was Kylo turning to the good side, finally. So you could say the rise of Skywalker was every time the Luke's Force Ghost came out of uh, the flames. I don't know, but that was the rise of Skywalker. And in any case, it also definitely sets it up for plenty of spin-offs and movies, which Disney will be just in a room, uh, you know, a big boardroom with a huge table, and they're all around laughing with cigars. Ha 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 ha! Ha ha! They don't even know why they're laughing. They're just laughing at Disney because they can't help but laugh with all the franchises they've got lined up after this movie. But anyway, that's, that's The Rise of Skywalker. That was just me explaining it and at the same time trying to figure out how I feel about it. I feel like I would have to see it again. Other people will probably say, oh, nope, I'm never watching it again. I think that's a bit childish. I don't want to be childish. I'm trying to be a grown-up here. Did they destroy my childhood memories? No, because I see the original trilogy as something that's a package deal on its own. If I watch the original trilogy, I just watch it on its own. And those memories come back, of course, like any movie, when you see when you're a child. Any movie you see when you're a child, you're going to have a different perspective at the time. You know? Your worldview is your house and your neighborhood. That's the biggest thing out there. So when you see Star Wars, that's a whole universe beyond. But, you know, when you get to be in your 30s and 40s and 50s, your perspective has changed because of things that you've experienced and that you project now onto things when you see it and your opinions of it. So Star Wars was never going to make all us Star Wars kids feel the same. There's no way. There's no way. Even if we all wrote it ourselves, because we all would write a different one. So in some ways, I suppose I'm telling the fans to just, to just let go a bit. It is what it is. It happened. Could it have been done better? All three of them? The new movies? Yes. How? By having a plan. By sitting down, thinking about it, how to play it through to the end to think of the end game yes I'm quoting Marvel but to think of the end game literally to start there to literally write the end game uh, did Marvel have source material yes they had the comics did Star Wars have source material yes I'm sorry but yes there's plenty of books Star Wars books and comics that were written about Star Wars there's Lucas himself could ask to, to draft different stories to work with them closer so Yes, there was a way to do it properly, which was to decide how it was going to finish. And then based on the big finish, based on the right finish, the logical, logical finish, the one that was most respectful to the legends, to the lore, to the icons, to the canon, and then you build up the story leading to that and what fantastical ways they could get there. That's how you make that story. You don't come in at the last minute minute, and you don't throw it to different directors unless they keep to the story do you want different di directors and flesh, fresh blood of course they did that with Marvel and it worked everyone can put a unique spin on it as long as they stick to the handbook 
It's really simple. You give them the handbook, boom. Slap it down the table, and you say, here's some things to go by. You can't deviate from this because it'll screw up the end movie. It'll screw up the end of the story. And that's okay to say because every, everything has to lead to that point. So you can go crazy here as long as you stick within these simple guidelines. We're not trying to control your artistic vision, but stick with these guidelines. That's all they had to do. It was just to be smart about it. Especially with such a huge franchise like this, it just seemed not fair. So that's the part where I do get passionate, passionate about. It just wasn't fair to treat it like this, to play it by ear. To say, oh, let's throw it to J.J. Abrams, see where he sets it. Oh, let's give it to Ryan Johnson, want to go in a different direction, see where he takes it. Take the reins, man, go nuts. You can't do that, because that's when you get to this point. Fans go nuts, critics, critics go nuts, whatever the case may be. And then there's a panic, because the end result, unfortunately, is money. I'm sorry, in many cases. Uh, it's, you've got to make your money back, first of all, and then make some money on top of it. So you make changes based on fandom, on fan feedback, which also is not the best thing. It's not the best thing. You should listen to them. You should see that you're headed in the wrong direction. Yes, 100%. But should you completely base your movie on what the fans wanted? No, not, not that either. That's also wrong. Because then every movie would just be a fan movie. That makes no sense. Movies and stories come from those people who are making it and then presented to us and we watch it and we take it in if you want to make a movie go make your own movie you know i say that because i'm defending i suppose the people who have worked hard on all these movies not just the the directors but the writers the carpenters the electricians everyone in the background the set pieces the designers the costume designers hair makeup people people who rent the trailers um you know everybody the food trucks I mean, I'm going to be honest, this is a big thing, you know? I've worked in television for over 20 years, and it's similar in that, yes, when you go on a live shoot and you go behind the scenes, studio show or anything, or a live show, there are so many people behind it, the showrunners, the, the stage stagehands, the, the ones down uh, on the stage getting it ready, rigging everything up. I mean, my God, think of how much there is for a movie. So all these people put their heart and soul into this and did the best they could. Just because there wasn't someone there to lead the way properly is necessarily not their fault. They really should have turned to Marvel Studios to get some tips. Because that's where it was done right. Someone needs to be there to steer the ship. In any case, how do I feel about it? I feel like I need to see it again. I don't hate it. I, I, I can't be a hater of it. I don't know if I'll develop a hate for it. <laughs> but at this moment, only seeing it once, I don't hate it. Could I live with it? Am I satisfied with this as the final story, as the ending of the Skywalker story? I'll have to be, I suppose. Unless someone does some spin-off and, and messes with the story more. I'll say I didn't expect any more. I didn't. I'm sorry to say, based on what has already happened with The Last Jedi, I didn't expect too much more. Um, I don't know what else they could have done. Uh, again, were the actors good? Were the special effects good? Of course they were. Industrial Light and Magic have been bringing it since back in the day. They have been leading the way in special effects. That's, that goes without saying. They are... Yeah, the trendsetters, the forerunners, they are the grandfathers of special effects. So ILM always brings it, and their entire crew. But the story could have certainly been better because it should have fit into a, a larger story arc that should have been decided before The Force Awakens. Should have been decided way back then. Um, so I'm satisfied in, in the fact that it's over and there's no more wondering. Uh, she's a Palpatine, Ben's Ben turned good at the last. Uh, Luke finally said it is important to be a Jedi. <laughs> I, I, again, it was like a giant, a giant fix, a giant retcon for real. The whole movie was a, a retcon to fix it back on track, which means now it needs another movie, really. But anyway, it is what it is. And uh, 
I'll probably have to see it again before I make a final judgment uh, and I'll chat with some other friends before I make a, a final judgment because I want to get their input definitely going to talk to Danny T uh, and I saw it with Adam and Gotham and we haven't caught up yet so I will definitely catch up with them so there'll be some more podcasts to come where we have a chat hopefully they have opposing views which is always hilarious and even better if maybe we could argue some points which I'm sure we will but um, it is what it is I'm not angry at it and don't hate it but i'm just feeling a bit flat but i do like it better than last jedi that's about all i can say to wrap that up and how i feel uh if you like the last jedi you probably won't like this if you hated the last jedi you'll like this just by default but as always always make your own opinion if you didn't like it maybe see it again give it a chance um but uh yeah that's that's all i can say for right now that's that's how i feel i have spoken and if you've seen Mandalorian, you know what I'm talking about. I have spoken. All right, we'll catch you next time. By all means, please listen and share and um, leave a comment if you like and uh, check us out on Spotify. All right, see you next time and we'll definitely have more podcasts on Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. See ya.